Welcome to the Lunch Rentals Podcast. I'm Ryan Hill. This week, we're answering listener questions. Joey is here to cover the photo side of things, and we've finally gotten enough video questions to bring on our video producer, Dom. We'll cover everything from the history of lens rentals to why it's so hard to find a video camera that shoots decent stills. Here are Joey and Dom. Dom and Joey, welcome to the Lens Rentals Podcast. Thank you for joining me. Good afternoon. Are you ready to answer some listener questions? Yes. All right, great. Everybody sounds super excited. (laughs) Here we go. I'm going to get right into it. So, you know, we don't talk too long about our t-shirts in this episode and actually get through a lot of questions. Starting with this question from Cole, I'm starting with a general one. In regards to camera rentals, do you notice a higher interest in the latest technology or do customers moreover stick to equipment that has been around for years? You want to take this one, Don? Yeah, I like, I like this one. You know, there's no straightforward objective answer to this, but um, I've definitely noticed that it is a trend that people are going to want to try to rent the newer technology as like a try before they buy type thing. Right. Um, and so like, for example, if they, they, they most likely own the thing that they are really, really comfortable with. And I think it trends more so that they would rent the newer technology to see if they like it. We, I hear this conversation all the time up front with people coming in and renting the R5, the EOS R, R5, R6, and um, talking about it for that exact reason, saying, oh, I rented this because I'm really thinking about switching over to the mirrorless. I own a 5D3 or I own a 5D4 or a 60, 70D. And um, I hear that conversation all the time. Yeah, for almost any new product we have, there's like a few week up to a couple month period where we can't keep it on the shelf because everybody wants to try it out and see what's up. And then either it stays popular, like the FS7 and C300s and stuff, the things that become these tried and true relied upon cameras or excitement sort of wears off. And Right. And even then, sometimes like I remember when the 5D4 came out like a year later, we were still heavily renting the 5D3. Yeah, yeah, that's true. As for like right. backups and stuff. Yeah. So I guess the the answer is not super illuminating because it's uh, uh both and neither, and it, it, really it depends. Just, it depends on the gear. Yeah, I know. That's why I take a look at that question and say, I love that question, but it, it's it is really a bit of an all over the place answer. Yeah. Well, this next one from Christian will have, I think, a more specific answer to uh, why is the Sigma Art lens line so popular with photographers? and videographers alike and how can canon nikon and sony compete well it's popular because it's often cheaper than the main party offerings right and quality is either just as good or in some cases better sometimes there are offerings that sigma has that the other brands don't have so they've really found their niche um, especially with all their primes uh can the other ones compete i mean i think they are competing they're still selling all their lenses. They're still putting out new designs. Mm-hmm. They're still, you know, in some cases they are still better. Like they're going to continue to be more expensive than Sigma yeah. probably, but Canon, Canon zooms are still better than Sigma zooms just across the board, mm-hmm. but the primes really kind of punch them in the mouth. So, If anybody listening is unfamiliar with Sigma's art line, uh, what are some good lenses in that line? How do they compare to Canon's more popular lenses. Uh, the 8512, I feel like I've heard a lot about. Yeah, definitely that 85, especially in comparison to the Canon L85, you have a huge focus area. Like the focus ring actual like rubber grip area is enormous on that 85 and I think that is a nice thing for professional use just if you're manually focusing that or also just like for the entire feel of it. Some some people like actually just a larger prime, the weight of a larger prime and just the whole the feel of it. That eighty five is amazing. That one oh five is really spectacular too. Oh yeah. The the fifty is a pretty really uh, there's a really, really great fifty. Um the thirty five is also excellent, one of the best thirty fives out there. Um the fourteen one point eight is a thing that other companies don't really have. It's a spectacular lens. Oh, the other really great thing about Sigma, the use of that USB dock, um, often, uh, especially 35s and 50s, 
uh, in a DSLR will need different amounts of autofocus micro adjustment for different focal distances. That is something you can't do with a Canon lens or a Nikon lens. They just, they don't allow for that in camera. But the Sony dock or the Sigma dock actually allows you to do a micro adjustment at four different distances per focal length. Oh, that's uh, cool. I didn't know that. It really dials it in. So uh, a lot of times we'll, customers will complain like like, like they they get the 51.2. And most of the time it works pretty well. Occasionally it does need some micro adjustment to whatever camera body they're using. And it doesn't necessarily need the same amount if you're shooting people five feet away versus, you know, 20 feet away. Mm -hmm. So if you set a single adjustment, one of those might end up being wrong. Uh, Uh, Yeah. I never really considered that, but that makes sense now. Yeah. Yeah. With the Sigma, you can, you're setting like your minimum distance, you're setting infinity and you're setting two points in between Mm -hmm. so that at any distance, it knows a much better idea of how much to compensate. And once you have it dialed in, it's great. I do this for locals all the time. Not, uh, not not through lens rentals. I do it on my, on the side privately. Oh yeah. I I help them out with that. Sneaky side hustle. Um, Because it is kind of an involved process, but once you're used to it, it doesn't take that long. Oh, that's really cool. So also firmware updates. It's the only way to update a firmware on a lens. Yeah, it makes firmware updates a lot easier for us. We like that. Totally. All right. This next one, also in lens territory, but uh, Dom, I think this will be more up your alley uh, in terms of video. This is from Brian. The question is, if I want to use PL mount lenses on a full frame DSLR like the Sony a7S III and I use a PL to E mount adapter, is there a way to do this without shooting in a PSC mode on the camera? Yes. So um, I think what they are running into is actually a lens illumination problem and not a uh, lens mount adapting uh, problem. Uh, The lens that uh, the PL lens that he is trying to get on to, uh, yes, the Sony a7S III full frame camera, um, it probably is designed to only illuminate a super 35 sized image sensor, which, um, a lot of Sydney lenses only are, uh, it's funny because the, the, um, the concept of full frame cinematography is actually, um, sort of a new one, um, really. And so these very expensive Cine lenses actually, uh, weren't designed to cover full frame. They're co- designed to cover super 35. There's the industry, cinema standard and now we're really kind of just now over the past couple of years starting to get used to the idea of actually capturing video in the same image format that still photography is in which is actually what full frame is yeah that's because even though a lot of the movie cam- old movie cameras and the old film still cameras were using 35 millimeter film they were using it in opposite directions so your film cameras are running it yes. vertically and your your uh, or your video cameras are running it vertically, and your your still cameras are running it horizontally. So you're limited by either 24 millimeters on your width or 24 millimeters on your height. So it's either it's either larger or smaller depending on which way you're going. With it. Right, and the we should cover the basic fact that if you're unfamiliar with these terms, Super 35 in terms of sensor size is not equivalent, but close enough to equivalent to APS-C crop frame sensor on digital still cameras. Right. Um, it is technically different sizes, but for most purposes, these are interchangeable terms between video and still cameras, meaning a smaller sensor size than a 35 millimeter full frame. Right. right. And so our friend Brian, um, rightfully so, because this can be confusing, he, he put his cine lens on an adapter onto a full frame lens, onto a full frame camera and he may have thought that the problem might have been in the, maybe the flange distance or the something having to do with the mount um, going from PL to uh, E, he said. Um, but really what's going on there is, is probably a lens illumination uh, thing. Right. So the, the lens was never designed to cover the size of the sensor yeah. that is in the A7. The image circle is too small. Right. No, I was going to say a couple of great um, Cine Primes that offer full frame coverage um, are the Zeiss CP2s, Canon CNEs, and the um, very, very affordable, but also nice and professional Sigma Cine Primes. 
where they're where you're probably mostly going to have a problem is with, is with zooms. I would say most Sony zooms probably aren't going to offer that full frame illumination. Right. right, especially anything made more than like five years ago or so. Yeah, I want to say there's there was one Zeiss CP2 that wasn't full frame and it was like an 18. I think. Yeah, that's a good point. It can vary by focal. It's but I same think, deal, I think, with some of the CNEs. I think all of the CP3s are full frame. Yeah. But, you know, if you're looking to rent uh, or buy or whatever uh, a PL mount lens for a full frame DSLR and you're using one of these adapters, it's a pretty easy Google to figure out whether the lens will cover. Yeah, I'm pretty sure all the Rokinon scenes all cover full frame as well. Right. And that's this is all not oh, to yeah. say necessarily that the adapter has nothing to do with it. Um, you know, adapters, once you're into adapter territory, a lot of these are made by a lot of different companies. Um, some of them work better than others. I'm sure there are some PL adapters that vignette more in like a full frame mode than in an APS-C mode. You might even have some that prevent you from uh, covering a full frame. Well, typically... More likely, though, it's yeah, a lens issue it, than an adapter issue. Typically, those adapters, uh, as long as they don't have any optical elements in them, which most of them don't, they're not affecting image circles so much as they're affecting flange distance. Right. So yeah, exactly. If, unless the tolerances are really tight, you may end up with your focus scales being off. Yeah, almost yeah. certainly. Unless you're going to get in and shim the lens a lot. Right. But you're probably not going to do that. Please don't shim our lenses. Yeah, don't do that to ours. <laughs> we, probably don't do it to yours either. We, we calibrate them very specifically. So uh, This next one is in a really similar vein. So I, I put them kind of in a row. This is from Josh. Why hasn't a PL to ERF or EF adapter been produced that includes PL lens metadata to camera? And this one is complicated. Dom, I'm I'm yeah, curious. Right. Um, this is a, a little bit over my head. <laughs> I'm going to try to answer this as much as possible. I, I think this might be a supply and demand type thing. I completely agree. I, I have the supply and demand in my notes for this one. Right. Well, <laughs> yeah. the, the basic answer is, most of those lenses don't have electronic contacts. Especially the older. The only thing that you would be getting from um, that is a nice um, electronic focus distance, which um, is a nice tool. And then, I don't know, what else What else would you get from metadata from that? Uh, iris. Uh, obviously, yeah. your focal length. Yeah, your iris, focal length, focus distance. Right. I, I think most lens adapter manufacturers are thinking, well, it costs quite a bit of money to add electronics to a purely mechanical adapter. Yep. Um, in some cases, that's just adding the necessary contacts and computer or whatever into the adapter. And in some cases, that involves licensing. And in a, say, EF to E adapter for still photography, that is not really negotiable. You kind of have to have that stuff in an adapter for it to be useful. And a lot of like EF lenses, for instance, you can't even control the iris unless you have um, electronic communication in a PL adapter. It's more of an option. And I think people's calculation is just that it's not worth the extra money to simply display iris, maybe focus distance, maybe focal length for a PL mount lens where you can kind of see all that information. Every PL mount lens is entirely manual, so you don't need to deal with autofocus, anything like that. I mean, if you it's ever... just not worth, I think to most people, the, trouble have y'all ever worked with a dp or an editor that was like i need to know what focal length and what aperture this was shot right. and they do exist that that is a necessity in some workflows especially if you're doing any visual effects work okay yeah. but if you're doing visual effects work you're not adapting your pl mount lens to a r5 or something right and one of the pros would be this is a relatively new development in PL mount lenses, but your metadata is not limited to the kind of stuff that your metadata is limited to in a still photography lens. Right. Some of these lenses can pass on vignetting and distortion information. Some of them can even pass on information from an internal gyroscope. So you're getting tilt and oh, pan. That's, nice. that's also very helpful for visual effects. But if you're doing that, you're probably using something way more. Even if the adapter could pass along that information, your Canon R5 has no reason to be able yeah. to write that metadata into right. the file. So it would have to be supported on the software end. So there are all 
long story short, a million different complications that make it not really worth it for the limited amount of information you're going to get. This became a really complicated question. I like this one a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, yeah. It's, it's a good question. Because um, of that. Yeah. It's a longer, more complicated answer than you would expect. It's also it, not to say that it won't happen eventually. You know, as, as these RF mounts are adopted more widely, uh, it's certainly possible to do. It just hasn't happened yet, as far as I know. All right. This next one is from William. We're blowing through these. Knock them down. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is kind of a long question. I cut it down, but I didn't cut it down a lot. So uh, from William, I mostly do video. However, it's often critical that I take a few photos of the event that I'm covering. Photos are not the main reason I'm usually hired, but it's usually a required deliverable. This means that I must use a mirrorless or DSLR camera for events where camcorders would be more ideal. The main reason this is a problem for me is the infuriating 30 minute record time or excuse me, Uh 30 minute record limit. This brings me to my question with several Panasonic cameras and I believe a version of the a7 III finally getting rid of that 30 minute record limit. Do you foresee more companies following that path? And there's a follow up question, but I'll get to that after we oh, cover this. William, first I have such good news for you. Yeah, this one is surprisingly complicated and interesting, too. If you didn't know this already, that 30 minute record limit, it's actually 29 minutes and 59 seconds. It was instituted because the EU got together and decided to tax video cameras at a higher rate than still cameras. It's a five to 12 percent difference. That started in 2006. That is why companies wouldn't let their still cameras record longer, even though they could technically do it, so they wouldn't have to pay higher prices. Uh, like when it was the 5D Mark II came out, the original limit was like 14 minutes because they were using FAT32, which limited you to four gigabyte file sizes. And at the current codec they were using, that was the cap. Right. And that's why that happened. But then, you know, the next generation oh, now I can record for almost 30 minutes. Well, why can't I record for more than 30 minutes? It's because of taxes. But the EU did away with that in 2018, which is why the Panasonics are doing it now, why the Sonys are doing it now. And I think we'll see either, I think every future release will see that completely gone. Um, and we may see some firmware updates that will fix uh, other cameras. Yeah. I will say the other side of that coin, though, is I think when a lot of people found out that fact, the like 29 minute record time. It's only for taxes. We can get, if you can get around this, get around it. It's in some cameras, not only for taxes. Yeah. Some, uh, some places it's like management. Yeah. Taking the five D three as an example, magic lantern was a really uh, popular like firmware hack on those cameras that would let you get around that record time limit. But then sometimes you're going to end up overheating your camera. O- often, often, especially I won't say especially, but we often find that with like the A7S, for instance. Yeah. I mean, the small form factor cameras aren't designed to have the kind of airflow. Right. That Yeah, exactly. Have. But like, yeah, I guess what we're saying is it, just because either that 30 minute limit is eliminated by firmware or you find a way to get around it, it's not necessarily a catch all for any sort of overheating issues. You could still run into just a like thermodynamic record time limit. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you're doing any kind of dedicated video work, even if you need to pull stills from it, get a dedicated video camera. Don't get a camera made for stills that does video. Right. Yeah. Which sucks because that is a really, it's a difficult position to be in, but I would almost recommend two different cameras. Right. And if you're doing this super often, if you need to pull stills, uh, it's really going to depend on what kind of resolution you want the stills to be. Well, Hey, let me hit you with William's follow up question. Oh shit. Alternatively, is there any video camera that can take decent stills? Dom, you got an answer for this one? Um, <laughs> C70? Sure. Uh, yeah. How about that? That would be the closest. I didn't consider the C70, but that's not a great video camera. <laughs> that would be my problem. <laughs> it's mean, not really good at both. It's not good at either thing, really. It's always been popular to pull stills from a red. Yeah, I feel yeah. like red is always talking about that like the Komodo or something, but it would be cheaper. I would imagine it would be cheaper for William to just buy a second still f- camera than shoot all yeah. of his projects. That on I would agree with the uh, pocket cam pocket 4k and 6k. I've been on a singular shoot where they wanted me to grab production stills from the camera. And I was like, Oh wow, there it is. There's the little still button. Boop. I had to check seven times to make sure that it even took one. It gives you no <laughs> right. 
it gives you no register whatsoever um, that you oh, took wow. anything. Um, and I ended up taking like 30 pictures because I was just jamming the button. <laughs> That's <laughs> weird. That's far for the course. Yeah. With, with I think my you. answer for is there any video camera that can take decent stills? I, I mean, depends on your definition of decent, but I would say yeah. no. Right. Yeah, my my I think um, an A seven S three would be an excellent option. It's an excellent video camera. You could pop it into photo mode too, and uh, they lifted the limit on on that, right? Or is that the uh, the I think just the A seven three? I don't know the about A7. the A seven S three. I mean, I guess how often are you blowing up production stills to large prints? Probably not super often. Yeah, it depends on what William is doing. I would I imagine, guess, based on the description, that it's either some sort of corporate event or a, like a wedding, maybe. Uh, I hope it's not yeah. a wedding. I, I would imagine any 4K or 6K camera, any still out of that would be fine enough for just about anything you'd want to do. I wouldn't necessarily be worried about resolution. I would be more worried about like... I don't know, like motion blur and shutter speed. Like uh, it doesn't know, always transfer well. Things like are kind of just gonna look like a still from a video, you know? Sure, but I mean, you'd get yeah. the same results at the same settings with a still camera, right? Right, that's true. I more mean so maybe better to have a still camera where you can adjust those settings. Yeah, but if you're just pulling production stills, I don't see. It. Whip out your cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> that really, honestly, that's the best answer. Actually, you know, if I, you have a decent I hate, phone, I hate that answer. But much yeah. better stills than you could pull from any video camera. I think that's I, great. iPhones, when you're recording video, has a button to get a still while you're doing it. Yeah. And I more mean like record your video with your video camera and like. Look, if it's good enough for Soderbergh, it's good enough for yeah, me. Yeah, take some stills with your iPhone. They're not bad. I feel like nobody wants to take stills with their iPhone, but they're. <laughs> <laughs> they're fine. I mean, for a client who they're doesn't good. want to hire a photographer, but good enough. You, you, why don't you take some iPhone photos? Sure. All right. right. I feel like that's a good one. I hope that helps. <laughs> I, I, I'm, He's probably going to be like, I love the idea that he never considered an iPhone. Like, <laughs> he's <laughs> he's yeah, like, yeah, like, guys. Guys. You know, thinking we just like, Oh, we're geniuses for suggesting an iPhone. Like, yeah. I, I, I've thought about an iPhone before. He hates us right now. Yeah, probably. All yeah. right, next question. Sorry, bud. Actually, not next question. We're going to take a break, uh, and when we come back, we'll answer a question about film photography, Joey. Boo-hoo, yay! Did I, just right. say, I just said that out loud. Yeah, well, <laughs> leave that in. <laughs> if you only know lens rentals from our yelling about cameras on the internet, there's more to the story. We're actually the largest online videography and photography equipment rental house in the entire world. Cameras, lenses, lights, audio, drones, just about anything. Here's how it works. Just go to lensrentals.com and tell us what you need and when you need it. We ship it straight to you in protective cases. You use it for whatever your heart desires, then ship it back to us with the included return label. Next time you need equipment for a shoot, head to lensrentals.com slash podcast for a discount on your order. That's lensrentals.com slash podcast. Welcome back to the Lynn Journals podcast. We are answering listener questions with Joey and Dom. And this next one is from Carson. What is the best advice you have received from professional photographers who shot and developed film before the digital era? Mm. Best advice I got. Yeah, I, mean, I, I like am, these I very am, broad technique ones. I am one of those photographers. Yeah, I Joey's, still shoot film. Joey's old. Um, best <laughs> advice? Uh, I mean, there's all sorts of things. Um, make sure you got a memory card in there. <laughs> yeah. Um, shoot a lot. That's, a, that's what the old film people say, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, the thing that I don't know how to answer this. The best advice is always to shoot a lot because through shooting a lot, you learn your own style. You learn how you see things. You gain proficiency in the gear. Once everything becomes second nature, that there's really nothing standing between you and the images you want to make. And in the film days, that used to cost a lot of money, a lot of time. And now with digital, now you can go out and rip out, you know, 10,000 shots in a night if you feel like it. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't cost you anymore. So that's the best advice I can give you is use that to your advantage. Uh, yeah. Use as much as possible to your advantage because that is a huge advantage. You yeah. can become light years better in a lot shorter time. The only, only other thing I'll add to this is that uh, if you're shooting digital, please, for the love of God, 
do not try and emulate a film look. <laughs> if you want to look like film, we'll cover shoot a, we'll film. Grab some film. All these. We got a lot of questions on the spreadsheet about a film look. Oh. You will be delighted. I promise you. Just get some it's film, put it in a film pit camera, and it's do so it. fun. It's and so it's yeah. not hard, and it's a little expensive, but it's not that and expensive. It's it's accessible. Yeah, it's not it's, so bad. It's not. It's not out of the out of the question. We, I will recommend, since we're covering film a little bit, if you want to learn how to get into it, uh, we did a very early episode of our podcast. We'll link to it. We interviewed our friends at Indie Film Lab about, you know, how to get into film processing and where to send your film and like what some good starter bodies are. That's a really good one. There's a ton yeah. of good advice there. Josh Motes is a really great resource. Yeah, they're super great people at Indie Film Lab. We'll shout them out whenever we can. Tell them, tell them I sent you and bug the shit out of them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This one, this one's for Dom. I mean, Joey, chip in if you like, but yeah. I think it's more Dom territory. Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, this is from William. Uh, are you expecting to branch out into more lighting anytime soon? Obviously, I don't expect to be able to rent an L.A. style five ton G&E truck. But in many places, the closest rental house that offers real service in that area is way too far away to be viable. And yeah, I mean, I, I think, Dom, you know our situation with lighting. Wow. Yeah, um, I have I have one word. It's actually it's three letters. LED. Basically, <laughs> um, yeah, LED lights, uh, high powered LED lights are the answer to that question. So, yeah, we are a shipping based company. And it is not exactly sustainable or economic to ship an airy M18 HMI light over to a couple of states. <laughs> it's it's yeah. basically a huge... I wish we it's could. A, yeah, we certainly wish we could. Right. So basically, um, yeah, if you know anything about shipping or shipping costs, uh, you'd know that that would be um, insanely pricey to do that. And so that is those are practically the only things for filmmaking purpose that we don't rent out because they're extremely heavy and spacious and awkward. So those types of things do typically usually stay at local cine gear, rental houses and uh, lighting houses, but good. Luckily for you, um, led technologies is really changing that up so we can get a high powered light into a relatively small and lightweight size of a light and um aperture is doing an ex a really really great job with that that's probably i would love to see the rental stats on this but that aperture 300d was probably that was the light of the year i would say that was absolutely yeah, super popular we have so many of those and they always rent yeah same with the 600 they're mega durable and now the, exactly and now the 600d coming out right and yep. they're never going to be like a 12k or something like that I mean, I, I shouldn't say never. LED lighting every year is getting brighter and brighter. But at least now, we don't have anything that, you know, you would light an exterior night scene with or anything like that. But we have some, like, I think those 300Ds are like a 2K tungsten equivalent, which is not bad. Basically, right now, we rent all the lights we can. You know, there, there's not bigger lights that are shippable that we haven't picked up. Yeah, a lot of brands have found ways to get um, a lot of that um, sort of grip and dolly type stuff to um, uh, smaller and pack smaller and able to get into a case like the um, the Kessler shuttle dolly and the uh, Kessler quick rails kit um, all packs up into a pretty thin case. It's still heavy. You're still, yeah. you're still definitely paying for a, a, a pretty heavy package, but... That Kessler quick rail system is excellent and the shutter dolly system. That is that is a real Hollywood solution in a couple of small cases that, that we can send to you across the country. And I think that's really, really cool. Same thing with C-stands too. Um, everyone is usually used to seeing C-stands um, put together with the legs um, on the shaft, but those all break up and um, go into a, uh, like a pretty nice thin case as well so yeah they're they're finding out solutions uh for these types of things but it's certainly a good observation um you're absolutely right there, there are just some of the bulky filmmaking items exactly like in the grip and electric area like uh, we we're not going to be sending anyone a um, gas-powered haunted generator 
Um, Ooh, I wish we had know. generators too. We <laughs> that. There's so much of the stuff we've looked at and just found to be impossible. Can I make a yeah. little plug real quick? Uh, what, uh, what? Can I make a little plug real quick? Yeah. Don't worry about yeah. shipping costs either because you could sign up for our Lens Rentals HD shipping. It's oh, free wow. shipping. Wow, a little Lens Rentals commercial. Right That's true. Here. Lens Rentals HD, $99 for shipping for the yep. whole year, both ways. Yeah, it doesn't matter how much you're shipping either. You could order it. If we carried bricks and you ordered a ton of bricks, it would still be free. I'll pay penance for that Lens Rentals commercial by also saying I, I, we don't get a lot of opportunity because you know we're not in that business to plug rental houses that aren't us. But for this particular thing, for something you can't rent from us, like larger dollies or like a big 12K light, you would be surprised how many towns have a grip house. Firefly Electric here in Memphis does a great job. They have five ton G&E trucks. And, you know, we're not a big market. Not the, a ton of people are shooting things in Memphis. So if the, we have one and can support it, probably you would be surprised the, you know, number of towns that also have one. All right. Next question. We'll we'll make this the last question because I think it's going to be a long answer. How did Lens Rental start? Question mark. Was your goal to become as big as you have or have you exceeded your original expectations? That question is from Joe. I mean, world domination's always been on the table. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, a lens and a camera love each other very much. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. Uh, Joey's work. You've worked here the longest. Yeah, Roger. Roger was not here to tell the story, but I'll tell it anyway. We've done a whole episode on this, by the way. Before you get to your answer, real quick, I'll plug our previous episode, oh, yeah. the Millionth Order episode. We did a big sort of retrospective on our Millionth Order. So, if you're really curious about the Lens Rental story, I'll give you the uh, Reader's Digest condensed version. Yeah, that's for old people. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm 42 years old. Um, Roger had bought a. He wanted to go on like a wilderness trip, or he wanted to shoot some eagles or some shit, something like that. So he bought a Eagles Canon 500. Or some shit. Yeah, he bought like a Canon 500 F4. <laughs> he's a he was a doctor. Yeah. So he had money. So he bought this lens, but he's like, I'm only going to use it this one time. So he's like, well, maybe I'll try and rent it out and see if anybody wants to rent it. So he took his whole kit and put it up on Fred Miranda forums, and it started renting. And so he bought some more stuff, and that started renting. And he was doing it all out of his garage. And now, uh, what are we? 14, 15 years later. Jeez, yeah. 2006. That's about right. Yeah, 15 years later. Here we are. Uh, we are now the largest by inventory, largest by order number, largest in the country. Yeah, wow. depending on how you count that. I don't know. I don't want to make assumptions, but I think if we're the largest in the U.S., it's probably safe to say we're the largest in the world. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say that. Yeah. World domination on the table. <laughs> and I, I think I came along. Uh, so I started working here in 2014. Mm -hmm. So I've been here for like. I don't know what's that seven years mm -hmm. like quarantine ruined my entire concept seven of time years. jesus and uh i think that's a really good representative time period because what has surprised us most i think in uh, in terms of like growth especially lately has been like video i, I it started as a photo company and yep. Our, video was sort of just starting to be part of it when i showed up and is now the bulk of our business at least half maybe more certainly revenue wise more right and it's not like our photo side has shrunk no no we just sort of also become it's, a video it's all company. grown it's all yeah grown. yeah when i started here 10 years ago uh i was employee number 32 i think or 34 that's wild and now we have almost 200 people and then dom came wow. in at another important milestone which is when we purchased our competitor <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah we yeah. acquired Lens Pro to go through violence. That was the, the largest, <laughs> it was the largest competitor we had bought. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What was left after you know the the after the dust settled? You know, I, I came out and it was it was great. We shook hands and said it was fine. Good battle. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah. I so yeah, Ron, always yeah. had been relative buds. Oh yeah, from trade shows and I've stuff. Been, I've been hanging out with Paul in Vegas for a while. So yeah, yeah right. Paul, there. Paul's story is is similar. Um, yeah, he he started a um, a basement um, lens lens rental thing, and he just he had all this uh, tracked it out all on paper with a highlighter. This person was renting out for this amount of time. Oh, and there was there was one yeah metal just one um no two metal shelves right next to each other that had all the gear on it and 
yeah, it, it was a couple of Canon Super Tellies. Um, so what I imagine he did is once he got, you know, his original investment going, he, he, he balled out on the, on the big Canon Super Tellies. Um, oh, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> And those, uh, cause he knew there would be an automatic rent, um, basically. And they did, and they kept going and going and going. And then he got a warehouse and then office space one, two, three, I think we're in the third right now. And then, yeah, I think 2017 lens rentals knocks on the door and says, Hey, come be how, family. How about it? Yeah. Now yeah, we're exactly. all best friends. Yeah. yeah, and then only six months after that, uh, yeah, I am bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, coming out of film school, and um, said, "This will be a this will be a fine place to work." And I and I was uh, I, I I had probably read, yeah, I think I knew going into my interview that that um, they had just recently merged. Well, let's we'll so. send you some Coronas for family. Oh yeah, Familia, 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 <laughs> <laughs> Dom. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, your name. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally. Yeah, it's about the family. <laughs> family. <laughs> One of these days, I'll give you a 10 second car. <laughs> All right, we'll call it there. Thank you both for joining us. All right. Yeah, thank you for having me. We'll do another one soon. Sweet. Thanks for listening to the Lunch Rentals podcast. As always, if you have a question you'd like answered on the show, check the show notes for a link to the Google form. If we answer your question during an episode, we'll even send you some rental credit for your trouble. As always, make sure to visit lensrentals.com podcast for a discount on your next order from us. And if you're enjoying the show, you can support it by subscribing and giving us a review on Apple Podcasts. We're on Instagram and Twitter at lensrentals. And thanks to Jacques Granger for our theme music. More of his work can be found at revengebodymemphis.bandcamp.com. On the next episode of the Lens Rentals podcast, Barney Britton of DP Review is joining us for a new gear rodeo. We'll discuss our impressions of a few major releases and announcements, including the Nikon Z9 and the Canon R3 on the next episode of the Lens Rentals podcast. Podcast.